Hi girls, this is Miss Gaska. Today I'm going over English 3, Semester 2, Week 2, Activity 5.8, A Unity of Opposites. Our learning targets for this activity are to evaluate a primary document as a source of insight into an author's values and beliefs, and to analyze how an author's personal experiences inform writing. So to preview, American author Alice Walker once said of Zora Neale Hurston, she became an orphan at nine, a runaway at 14, maid and manicurist before she was 20, and with one dress and a dream, managed to become Zora Neale Hurston, author and anthropologist. In this activity, you will read an essay written by Hurston in 1928 to better understand the historical context of her work and think about the following aspects. What are following questions? What aspects of the Harlem Renaissance affected the arts and beliefs of the time? How did the creators, the artists, and the politicians influence the events of the time period? So, setting a purpose for reading. This is the most important thing to pay attention to while you are reading. First of all, we're going to be underlining words and phrases that indicate the author's beliefs about herself. So, beliefs about herself, that's what we're underlining. We're going to put a star next to text that discusses the philosophy, arts, and daily life of the Harlem Renaissance. Um, let me see if I can make a star. Yay! Ooh, how do I let go of this thing? <laughs> well, there it is. There's my star. All you have to do is right click and finish your shape. Then we're, ooh, snap. Then we're going to circle unknown words and phrases, trying to determine the meaning of those words by using context clues, word parts, or a dictionary. So, if you want to read a little bit about Zora Neale Hurston's background, which I recommend in order to understand the book that you're about to read that she wrote, um, it's right here and you're free to do so. Also notice here she says she struggled to finish high school and she still had not accomplished that by age 26. But she still went on to graduate from college and wrote these amazing books that we're still reading today. So How It Feels to Be Colored Me by Zora Neale Hurston. Now I'm going to read the first two paragraphs with you, but after that it's up to you to continue reading and annotating. And remember, we're looking at aspects of the Harlem Renaissance such as philosophy, arts, and daily life to put a star next to, and underlining words and phrases about her beliefs regarding herself. I am colored, but I offer nothing in the way of extenuating circumstances except the fact that I am the only Negro in the United States whose grandfather on the mother's side was not an Indian chief. So th these are claims that she's making about herself. She's talking about her ethnic background and she doesn't offer anything um, special. Like, nothing is special about her except that she's the only person who's black who doesn't claim to have an Indian chief as a grandfather. And that's her attempt at irony because a lot of people like to say that they're part Native American um, when in reality not as many people are that think they are. And this isn't only among black people that do this. This is um, many different races claim to have Native American ancestry but actually don't have any um, or at least any that's provable. So I remember the very day I became colored. Ooh, that's kind of interesting. Up to my 13th year, I lived in the little Negro town of Eatonville, Florida. It is exclusively a colored town. The only white people I knew passed through town going to or coming from Orlando. The native whites rode dusty horses. The northern tourists chugged down the sandy village road in automobiles. The, the town knew the southerners and never stopped cane chewing when they passed, but the northerners were something else again. They were peered at cautiously from behind curtains by the timid. The more venturesome would come out on the porch and watch them go past and got just as much pleasure out of the tourists as the tourists got out of the village. So she doesn't really say much about herself except that she didn't become colored until she was 13, I guess? So... I don't know if any of this so far says anything about the Harlem Renaissance, but as we keep going, continue to look for different things that suggest um, ideals of the Harlem Renaissance. I'm going to go down to the questions. Um, 
and I'm going to say, um, actually, hold on. I wanted to circle some words that you may or may not be familiar with. She has extenuating, you may not know. Um, she also has... Venturesome, you may not know that word. Anyway, so meet me down in the questions after you're done annotating this piece, and we'll see what you come up with. So for the first question, it says, what happened to change Hurston's perspective of herself and her color? Why was this significant given the time period in which she lived? Support your answer. So you have two questions here to answer. You have what happened to change how she saw herself and her skin color, how she saw herself and how she saw people who have her skin color. And then why was this important uh, based on the time period that she wrote this in and in which she lived? And then give details from the text that support your answer. Don't forget to cite them. For number two, it says, what does an author mean by her self-description in paragraph five? I became a fast brown, warranted not to rub nor run. When it says that, think about when you wash clothing, how certain colors, if you use a certain kind of detergent, will run in the wash and not be as bright or not be, um, you know, as some of the uh, other clothes might get those colors on them. Um, for instance, if you wash something that's red in a, uh, a load of whites and you use bleach, then everything that comes out of that load is going to be pink when you're done. So think about that when she says this. For number three, it says, what does Hurston, why does Hurston choose to use the word circumlocutions in paragraph 11? How does this word contribute to the meaning of the text? So you're gonna have to look up what this word means um, in order to understand what this question is asking. But it's asking why she used that word in paragraph 11 and how that word contributes to the meaning of the text. So you're also going to have to find the meaning of the text and then um, explain how that word contributes to that meaning. For number four, what role does the author's use of figurative language play in developing the theme? What evidence from the text supports your answer? Now remember, figurative language is language that's not meant to be taken literally. Um, it's words or phrases that use similes, metaphors, um, analogies, comparisons, things like that. Um, that's what they mean usually when they're talking about figurative language. For instance, if I said the night was as bright as a... Uh, as bright as a light bulb, I don't know. That would be a simile, but obviously the night isn't really as bright as a light bulb. It's just a comparison to give the reader an idea of what it was like. So look for those figurative language examples and then explain how those figurative language things that she said contribute to the theme of the text, so the main message of the text. Then you have to find evidence to support your argument. For number five, how does the metaphor in the last paragraph relate to Hurston's statements earlier in the essay? How do the themes of the essay reflect those of the Harlem Renaissance? So you're going to have to go to the last paragraph and look for the metaphor, the comparison of two things not using like or as, um, and how they relate to statements earlier in the essay. Um, so also you have to explain how the themes reflect those of the Harlem Renaissance. So you're going to have to know what the themes of the Harlem Renaissance are, which hopefully you do thanks to the work from week one. And you're also going to need to be able to explain how those themes and how the themes in the essay relate to one another or reflect one another. So... Secondary source reading. In his essay, Zora Neale Hurston, A Negro Way of Speaking, Henry Louis Gates Jr. says of Hurston, virtually ignored after the early 50s, even by the black arts movement in the 60s, an otherwise noisy and intense spell of black image and myth-making that rescued so many black writers from remaindered oblivion. Hurston embodied a more or less harmonious but otherwise problematic unity of opposites. It is this complexity that refuses to lend itself to the glib categories of radical or conservative, black or negro, revolutionary or Uncle Tom, categories of little use in literary criticism. 
It is the same complexity embodied in her fiction that, until Alice Walker published her important essay in search of Zora Neale Hurston in Miss Magazine in 1975, had made Hurston's place in the black literary history an ambiguous one at best. So there are a few words here that you're going to want to need to familiarize yourself with. So we have remaindered, embodied, you probably can figure out what harmonious means. You probably know what problematic means. Glib. You may not know what radical means. I'm assuming you know what conservative means. Revolutionary. ambiguous. So, number six says, review your notes about the ideas and values of Harlem Renaissance. Then, review your responses to the two dependent, or the text dependent questions associated with Hurston's essay. Use this two column note organizer to consider Hurston's philosophy and to identify why Gates described Hurston as a unity of opposites. Enter inferences that you make from her text and cite textual evidence that supports your inferences. So the first one says, what philosophies and beliefs did Hurston share with the Harlem Renaissance and what ways did Hurston follow her own path? So you're looking back at your notes about the ideas and values of the Harlem Renaissance, first of all. Second of all, you're looking back at the responses to the text dependent questions and then you're sorting them based on this chart. So now that you have completed the two column notes, you're going to write a brief explanation, meaning like a paragraph, um, of the value of how it feels to be colored me as a primary source. So why is this important as a primary source? Think about the knowledge and understanding that readers can gain from the study of a primary source. So basically it's kind of like asking the source itself um, any questions that you have about it instead of asking somebody else. All right. So that's the end of English 3 semester 2 week 2. I hope that this has been helpful for you. If you still have any questions, please reach out to me. I'd be glad to help you. And thank you for watching. Have a great day.